Um, go ahead and practice. You have the workbook and the work manual. They both have problems. Chapter 6 will actually give you more explanation if, if you didn't think I explained it clearly enough. Um, and then week 4 in the workbook, that's going to have more practice problems for you to work on. So, the types of compounding. Now, what is compounding? Compounding is maybe is, is mixing something together um, to produce something else. So, there's two different types of compounding. There's the non-sterile compounding. This is intended to be used by the mouth or applied externally. Some examples are capsules, oral liquids, creams, ointments, emulsions, and pastes. These medications are placed in areas of the body where natural defenses can stop infections. The type of equipment for the non-sterile compounding is a prescription balance. All pharmacies must have one of these on premises as required by law. Most common is the class 3 balance. There is also class A to D balances with A being more sensitive and accurate than B and so forth. When using a prescription balance, it is common practice to put the weight on the right pan, ingredient, an ingredient or drug on the left pan. So this is important that the common one is the class three balance. Okay, make sure you're aware that class three balances are the ones used in pharmacies. Now class A and D, they are used in, in more um, specific pharmacies, but class 3 balance is definitely the one that you're going to want to know. Alright, so the types of equipments. Measuring equipments for liquids, graduated or conical cylinders, beakers, micropipeps. Graduated cylinders are the most accurate. Now, but conical cylinders are the easiest to clean. There's also a meniscus to measure from, which is a concave surface. You want to read the measurement from the bottom of the, sur of the meniscus. So I'm just going to draw a little picture right here. So let's say you have a test tube right here, okay? And if you put liquid inside, it's not going to be a straight line, but it's going to be a little curve like this. And you're going to see, you're going to see a little curve. What you're going to do is you're actually going to measure from the bottom of that meniscus or the curve. Now why it does that, it actually has to go into physics, but we are not here to learn about physics, so I will not be covering that. If you're interested, let me know, and I'll shoot, send you an email about explaining that. So, types of equipment. Compounding equipment is the mortar and pestle. Glass, wedge wood, or porcelain. Spatulas, ointment slabs, funnels, wank, pellet papers, filter paper, and heat source. And then ingredients. Sorry, going back to going back to the, the types of equipment, going back to the class three balance, um, if you read this and the first person to, I guess there really isn't any bonus points on here, but the first person to tell me the weight range of the class three balance in the comments below, they will get extra credit. So, feel free to go ahead and do that. All right, so the processing of compounding. So one of the ways, one of the techniques used for compounding is titration. The grinding of a drug solid utilizing a mortar and pestle to reduce the particle size or to mix two or more solids in order to a. Create a finer powder to make dissolution easier. B. Keep a cream or an ointment from feeling gritty. And C. Ensure thorough mixing of solid ingredients. So this is, these are all the answers. These aren't just, this isn't multiple choice. These are all things that titration does. So for example, let's say you have an aspirin and you want to break it down. You would use the mortar and pestle. Sorry, very poorly drawn mortar and pestle. Another process or technique is levigation. Entails dispersing a drug solid into a small amount of mineral oil, 
glycerin or other liquid and then incorporating this paste into an ointment. Three is geometric dilution, used to ensure mixing of a small amount of a potent drug with a large amount of a non-potent drug or, active or inactive compound. The process of compounding, again, is another one is dissolution. There are various techniques that can be used in dissolving a solid or solute into a solvent. Heating the solvent, reducing particle size by titration or levigation, solubilizing agents that coat the solute, and agitation of mixture. Another technique is stability. Various agents are used to hold the tablet or liquid a stable state for administration. So one of the things that we can do as pharmacy technicians inside a pharmacy is choose a container that's being used. Now we need to know certain things about, we need to take certain things into account when selecting a container. Child resistant caps. So sometimes um, when you work with older people, they can't open it up, so they request child resistant safety caps or sorry they, they request non child resistant caps um, and when I, I don't know if we've talked about it in the past or we're gonna talk about it but the laws and and what and how they require safety caps on all orders unless there's a special exception so never put in an injectable syringe Container interaction with products, amber or light resistant containers, and appropriate size. So you're never, ever, 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 never are you going to put an injectable syringe into a bottle. Okay? Injectable syringes always come in bags. Some of the medication also, it's going to interact with the bottle. So we need to make sure that there's no interaction there. Um, sometimes we see darker bottles, you know, usually it's the, the, the red, brown, or the, I guess the amber color, and that actually protects the medication from the light because light can actually alter the, the medication. And then the appropriate size, you know, if you're going to dispense five tablets, you're not going to, you're not going to give them a ginormous bottle. You're going to make sure the bottle's appropriate. Now the labeling requirements. So on a prescription, there's, there needs to be the generic or chemical name of all active ingredients, the name of vehicles or the liquid used to make a solution or the ointment based used, and compound topical products. Other label requirements requ as required by law. All right, so now sterile compounding. There's two different, or I guess there's three different types of hoods. Laminar flow hoods, horizontal flow, and hood, flow hoods, and vertical flow hoods. Horizontal flow hoods are used to prepare sterile preparations that are not toxic or chemotherapy, indicating that they must be vented to the outside or the air released must be filtered. Air is taken into unit at the bottom, passed through preliminary filter, which removes the get gross contamination, such as large particles of dust. Air is compressed and passed through a much finer filter called a high efficiency particulate air filter or HEPA filter. You'll definitely hear HEPA filter. You probably won't hear that, but that's what they're referring to. This removes virtually all of the particulate matter, including bacteria. Particulates of 0.3 microns or larger removed. This filter makes up the back part of the hood and the air is then forced up the back and blown to the front through the filter and towards the operator. This constant flow of the air toward the worker and out of the hood keeps bacteria and particulate laden air from the room from entering the hood through the opening. And this is the picture of a horizontal flow hood. So you see here, there's a filter right there that catches the bigger parts. And then you have here, the air comes up and it pushes the air out here and this is the HEPA filter. So this is what catches the tiny, tiny microns of dust and dirt. And then it pushes the air out towards you. The next one is a vertical flow hood. These are used to prepare toxic and chemotherapeutic drugs. 
They must be vented to the outside or air released back must be filtered. There are two types of vertical flow hoods, one which exhausts totally to the outside and the other which filters 30% of the air back into the room. This similarly works like the horizontal flow hood except that the filtered air is taken in through a grill directly in front of the worker, just below the work surface. The air is pulled through the bottom, pushed up the back of the unit, and blown vertically down from the HEPA filter, top of the hood. The front of the hood has an opening only large enough for hands and forearms and has a glass to protect the rest of the body from toxic drugs. Vertical airflow, protective clothing, and the configuration of the hood ensures the worker is not exposed to the toxic chemicals. So it's going to be important to know, for the hood, it's going to be important to know what they're used for. So it's going to be important to know that the vertical flow hood is used to prepare toxic and chemotherapeutic drugs, whereas the horizontal flow hood is used Let's go back. So it's used for the non-toxic and chemotherapy drugs, the non-chemotherapy drugs. All right. So next thing that's important. I guarantee this will be on a test. Absolutely guarantee it. So <clears throat> all work must be done six inches into the hood without any part of the body other than the hands and arms inside. <clears throat> Airflow must remain continuous. If turned off, one must wait at least 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes, before using the hood. More so, the work surface should be cleaned from side to side, starting in the back and working toward the front. Okay, that's another important thing. I'll repeat it again. Should be cleaned from side to side, starting in the back and working toward the front with 70% isopropyl alcohol. Now that's also important to know that 70% isopropyl alcohol is to be used when cleaning the hood. This is according to policy and procedures of the manual for the flow hood. You can also expect questions pertaining to this on the PTCB exam. And this is the picture of the vertical flow hood. So you can see you're standing right here and this right here is, is a glass shield. Usually it slides up and then it slides down. On the ones that I've worked with, if you slide up, if you slide up past a per certain point, it's actually going to beep at you, which is telling you, hey, you're too high up. It's not safe anymore. So what happens is the air circulates through here. As you can see, the air comes in through this glass place right here. Same place where your hands are. So this is where you put your hands. And the air comes down, gets blown up through the filter. It escapes the room through the HEPA filter, through the exhaust. And then 30% of it comes back into the air supply, which this right here is also a HEPA filter. So a direct path must be maintained between the filter and the area inside the hood where the manipulations are being performed. The hands should never obstruct airflow around the area where the needle enters the vial or ampule. Also, when pulling back the plunger of a syringe, the fingers should not come in contact with any part of the plunger except the flat part at the end. So you have a syringe. I think we're going to go over this in a little bit, so I'll wait to go over the, the syringe. Um, So the hands should never obstruct the airflow. This is going to be important too. How to use it, how to enter needles into the vial or ampule. Flow hood procedures and recommendations. More. Wash hands and arms before compounding or re-entering the hood. Hand washing should be done for a minimum of 30 seconds with cleaner and water in contact with the skin from elbows down. Keep in mind, touch is the leading cause of contamination. Also, remove any jewelry from the hands and wrists. It is important that you keep your hands within the cleaned area of the hood as much as possible. Do not touch your hair, face, or clothing. So this is another important part, is hand washing should be done for a minimum of 30 seconds with cleaner and water. Okay, that's going to be important as well. 
Now, I did this one thing where I cultured some cells and some of my beard hair actually got, just a little sample of it, got into the, the Petri dishes. And it was because I was careless when I started off and it, it was amazing that it actually grew as much as it did. So it's amazing, it's just don't let it happen because you're not supposed to do it. 